Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I appreciate each and every one of you being here with us. appreciate those that are joining us online that you've uh, made this your place of worship this morning. We're just trusting the Lord to do great things in each and everybody's life this day as we, uh, we go into this new worship service. The Bible says that if he's high and lifted up, that he'll draw all men to him. So that's our desire this morning, that we draw closer to the, the, the Lord and allow the Holy Spirit just to in, uh, instill in us uh, that love that Christ showed to us in his, uh, his coming, his living here, his dying, and his resurrection. Uh, hallelujah. What a great God we have. Soon and very soon we're going to see the Lord. Y'all stand. Help us to sing this song this morning. Soon and very soon. Uh, I don't have it, sis. Just a minute, you'll find the song out there. Are you glad you're saved? Amen. 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 <laughs>
Page number eight in your white song books.
remember our uh, Sunday school this evening, and remember our Wednesday night service, our midweek service starts at 7, and remember our youth program after school for uh, that starts at 6.30. Any more announcements? Any birthdays this week? I know Elijah has one today, if you'll stand up. Clayton, yeah. And mine is Wednesday, so say happy birthday. Spoken prayer request, raise a hand. Will you stand with you get some ushers, please? <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day and all be done for us. Father, Lord, just uh, Father, just thank you, Father, for the presence of your spirit here this morning, Father, Lord. Father, just uh, for the remainder of this service, Father, just take Brother Austin, Father, just hide him behind the cross, Father, Lord, that we'll see you and not him, Father. Touch him spiritually, Father, physically, Father, Lord. Just give him the worth to save, Father. Father, and as uh, we go throughout our everyday walk, Father, Father, just let the people we encounter just see you in us, Father, Lord, that we will let our light shine, Father. Father, the... Uh, we can be that witness for you, Father. Father, if there's that one here today that's lost, Father, if there's that one here today that's a backslidden, Father, that's a heavy burden, Father, just uh, let them come to you, Father, and just, uh, just leave everything at, at your feet this day, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> this morning for being with us. If you're joining us online, we appreciate that. Just count it an honor to have you the way we can get you here. And uh, for everyone except Miss Sheila Atkinson, because Mr. Larry has forbidden it, would you stand and please welcome everybody around you to church today. Do that if you will real quickly. Do that today. <coughs>
Hope you enjoyed the worship today. And as I said, we just counted a privilege to have you this morning. I'd like for you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter number four. If you'll turn there, Zechariah chapter number four. While you're turning, just as a little piece of trivia here, Zechariah means God remembers. That's what his name means, God remembers. Zechariah, by the way, is one of the youngest men to ever prophesy. He may be the youngest man uh, that has a title of a book in your Bible. As a matter of fact, when he's prophesying, he's contemporary with Haggai. Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying during the days of Esther, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And what's happening is the... Uh, uh, the Jewish nation has gone through the Babylonian captivity and now a, a remnant of the people has been allowed by Cyrus, the Persian king, uh, to come back to Jerusalem. And so there's been several years of this migration back to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem's in pretty bad shape. Uh, and you read about Nehemiah, how Nehemiah was inspired to build and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But before all that happened... God wanted the temple rebuilt. He wanted the focus of his worship reestablished and his authority recognized again. And so the temple was rebuilt before the walls were, and they faced great opposition in doing this. And so this is the context of what you and I will look at today. And we're going to stay with that context, not deviate much from it, but we're going to use it as an example. And... Um, Mainly, we're going to take our text from verse number 10 uh, using this title, Starting Small. Starting Small. Uh, verses 8 through 10 is what I want to read to you. And we'll go ahead and read those verses to you. And then we'll move on. Everything, by the way, starts small, doesn't it? Everybody sure starts small. <laughs> and uh, you couldn't tell by looking at me that I started too small, but it did. But uh, everything and everybody starts small. Uh, young people would get in real trouble uh, when they would try to, you know, go out and get in debt when they get out on their own and try to get everything that their parents did uh, in the beginning when their parents started small and built to a certain place. I've got a good friend. He's like me. He's got an old truck he drives around, and the tag on the front of his truck says, I started with nothing, still got most of it. You know, I can relate to that. Sure can. But uh, starting small, Ronald Reagan's mother told him he could never be too small for the Lord to use him. All things as we know it start small, as I said. The most huge churches, uh, mega churches, the Gateway Church, Lakewood Church, these churches that the, uh, you know, that's recognized as huge churches, uh, that's in our country today. Did you know most of those churches started in somebody's living room? Lakewood Church started in an old feed store. <laughs> and uh, I think it's uh, ranked the, the largest church in the nation today. Uh, but they started just small, this church. Uh, you say, well, this is still not too big a church, but it started a lot smaller than it is. And so great ideas uh, begin through inspired imaginations, dreams, if you will, visions, desires. Many major companies, Amazon, by the way, is probably no bigger company uh, than Amazon in the nation today. It started in a man's basement. What about that? I mean, uh, Henry Ford started tinkering with watches and made his first car in his, in his dad's farm shop. <laughs> I mean, they start small. Things like this start real small, Steve Jobs. And his friends started the Apple Computer Corporation in their garage. And so a lot of things are like that. Notice verse 8, if you will. It said, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Notice this statement. For who has despised... That word despise tells us a little bit about the opposition and difficulty that they were facing to do this, the day of small things. For they shall rejoice. That's after it's done. And that's while it's going on through God's provision. And shall see the plummet in the hand of Jerubbabel. In other words, they're going to see how, how precise this is getting done. With those seven, those sevens talking about uh, a, 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 a reflection of Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, 
where it talks about the eyes of the Lord, almost a direct quotation here, and those seven spirits uh, that he has into the world. Notice it said, in the hand of Jerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And so uh, in, re in reflection of small things and starting small, I'd like to use a few modern examples of things that inspired people uh, and what they did went on to be highly recognized and great things. Used a few right there. Uh, but I'd just like to encourage us this morning uh, to not give up, to not give in, uh, for you and I not to fall prey to that what's the use anyhow kind of attitude and that you and I would know uh, that uh, small things and starting small uh, listen, that God can bless and use those things. Every one of us, by the way, uh, he gives us a grand imagination formed and fashioned after himself. Uh, that imagination many times translates into vision, which translates into action, uh, which translates into something actually coming into being. Young people that are sitting here in our uh, sanctuary this morning, I would trust and hope would have some, some dreams uh, that they're thinking about, some vision, some hope, some desire, some things uh, that they would like to accomplish uh, maybe in their life. Maybe some of those things are something they're not real serious about and maybe the Lord has put something there uh, that really that just continually kind of develops in their thinking and they're uh, finding themselves kind of following a direction toward that. It's one of the jobs in ministry and one of the jobs in parenting, by the way, uh, that you and I might recognize those things in regards to young people and help them along on the destiny that the Lord would have them to fulfill and the way that he would have them go. The things that they that they seem to be so interested in, things that they seem to have such a desire for, seem that they seem to have a knack for. You and I need to pay attention to that. Do you agree to Today, we need to pay attention to those things. Certainly, there's things we need to steer them clear of, but certainly there is ways we need to help guide them into when it comes to things that the Lord, we can see that the Lord has placed in their heart to do. And so Jerubbabel had a job in front of him. It was God's will uh, that he bring this temple back into being that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. It wasn't him by himself. There was a whole lot of people involved in this. You and I need to understand today uh, that we're not lone rangers either, uh, that we're not by ourselves, that God has placed people around us to help us, to bless us, that God is with us, and God uses other people uh, to be a part of those things uh, that he has brought about and uh, that he is uh, bringing about in our life. He uses other people uh, to bring some of those things about. There's no greater feeling in the world, uh, by the way, than for you and I to be a blessing to somebody else, for you and I to be used of God in such a way, in a manner, in a fashion. And so when we think about just the small things that has inspired people. Many songs, by the way, have been inspired by such small little meaning, seemingly meaningless uh, uh, inspiration or little meaningless, so, uh, so to speak, uh, 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 exposure or uh, what am I saying? Just, just small things that wouldn't seem to mean a whole lot. John Newton, by the way, we all know his song, Amazing Grace. The choir had sung a song with some of those words in it this morning. Uh, he just simply wrote his testimony. He just simply wrote about his life. If you were to see his original poem, Amazing Grace, as a matter of fact, he didn't write it as a song. He wrote it as a poem. It was set to an old Irish melody, the one that we use and know the tune of Amazing Grace, but the whole poem of Amazing Grace, it'd take about four sheets if you wanted to read that. It was condensed into a small version and made and has become the uh, anthem of the church, if you will. Did John Newton ever know it would become such a great uh, inspiration to so many people? I don't know that he did. I mean, it was not that way in his lifetime, uh, but uh, he was just inspired from his own testimony, Charles Wesley, uh, one of the Wesley brothers that was uh, the founders of the Methodist church. Charles Wesley, when he was saved, he told a friend of his about him getting saved. And he, he said to his friend, he said, I imagine I need to keep this quiet. I imagine I need to be silent about this. His friend said, oh no, my brother. He said, if you had a thousand tongues uh, to tell it, said you should use them all for Jesus. What did he do? He goes home and he writes the great hymn of the church, oh, for a thousand tongues to 
thing. I mean, you know, just small inspiration. Stuart Hamlin may be a man that you recognize his name. If you're into the old cinemas, if you're into the old first singing cowboys like Roy Rogers and Tex Ritter and some of those guys, uh, Stuart Hamlin was one of those guys. As a matter of fact, his dad was a Methodist pastor, and like so many church kids, he grew up, he rebelled. Uh, he gets to Hollywood, which is, is in just its infancy back then, and uh, he's, a, he's a singing cowboy. Uh, he's a drinker. He's a carouser. He's a brawler. Uh, he winds up in jail out there a good little bit. Uh, the Great Crusade of the 40s that Billy Graham was out there, the Great Tent Crusade. Uh, later, Billy Graham was able to lead Stuart Hamlin to the Lord. And so Stuart Hamlin changes his ways drastically. And so one day, a friend of his, John Wayne, you may have heard of him. Uh, John Wayne was talking to Stuart Hamlin, and he said, uh, he said, I just want to ask you about this rumor that I've been hearing, that you have changed your ways. Stuart Hamlin says to John Wayne, he said, well, it is no secret secret what God can do. John Wayne says to his friend, he said, you need to go put those words to a song. Stuart Hamlin goes home and writes that great song. It is no secret what God can do. A little closer to home, Alan Baker. Anybody know Alan? Alan Baker used to be right here. He, used to, he grew up right here, now serving in his church. One day Alan gets in his little ranger pickup and he shuts the door and he happens to notice that his uh, his, his mirror is turned straight up toward the sky like that. And he reaches out to turn his mirror back down and he notices right on the bottom of that mirror it says object in mirror may be closer than they appear. He thought about that and he turned that mirror down. He goes home and he writes a song, Heaven is much closer than you think. I mean, my point is the Lord uses these small little things to inspire us. These small little things. Sometimes it's what you've said. Sometimes it may be what you you did. Sometime it may be just how you acted out in public. Sometime it may be just doing a job faithfully. One of my, one of my uh, illustrations I like to use, and I've used this one before, but it's been a long time, so maybe it won't seem too repetitive to you today. A fellow named Jimmy Webb. Jimmy Webb was a songwriter. He was from Oklahoma, out in that Midwestern area out there, and uh, he was a songwriter, and he'd written this hit song for a fellow named Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell's career was really hot back in the 70s and he wrote this song and the song was called By the Time I Get to Phoenix and it done so good for Glenn Campbell that he contacts Jimmy Webb and he said I'd like another location type song if you could write me another song like that and so uh, he's thinking about this Jimmy Webb's thinking about this and he's getting no inspiration and he's got you know it's he's kind of hitting the dead end a little bit right there and he takes this trip one day and on his trip he's coming through a county in Oklahoma called Wichita County, not Wichita, but Washita County, and he's coming through that, and at that time, the county owned the phone companies out there, and so out there in that area, the roads are really straight, and there's nothing to see out there, there's no houses to see, it's all just flat farmland, nothing out there, and the roads are just lined with hundreds of thousands of phone poles, they're just telephone poles all up and down the road, and he's coming along that road that day, and it's he's just out there by himself, he had met anybody, hadn't seen any houses, ever so often a car go by and he's passed these thousands of telephone poles, he's been driving for miles here and he happened to notice up there way up in, in the front of him in the sunshine there was a silhouette of a guy up on the top of a telephone pole up there and as he was getting closer to him he could see he had that phone in his hand up on top of that pole and his truck sitting down under it and in his mind he thought that is the absolute picture epitome of loneliness if, there, if I could think of anything that would seem so lonely, it's that side of this man way out here in the middle of nowhere doing his job, working by himself, and he started putting himself in that man's position. He started thinking of himself. He started thinking, well, that man's got family. That man's got things he likes. That man's got things he loves. That man's got things important to him. He's the kind of guy that look, people would drive by out here, look up there, not even give him a second look, not even think anything about him. 
Jimmy just doing his job and they just go right on by and pay him no attention. But Jimmy Webb starts thinking about this man and he starts getting all these thoughts and he brings all these connections. And so he writes a song about that man that's up on that, on that phone pole that day. And uh, after he wrote his song, he presents it to Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell sings it. He wins a Grammy for writing the song. And Billboard has rated that song as the 195th most recognizable top song of all time, Wichita Lineman. And my point is, that poor old guy up on that post, he probably didn't have a clue that he inspired such a song. He was just out there faithfully doing his job, but he inspired somebody to do something that the whole world recognizes, and probably even today, if he was still living, he still wouldn't know it was him. He had no idea who was driving by. He had no idea who was looking. What's the lesson? You and I may not have no idea who's driving by. We not may have no idea who's looking. We, not may, we may not have no idea who's paying attention. But if we do what we do faithfully, hallelujah, listen, it can bring inspiration to somebody else. Isn't that good? When we look back at the scriptures here, a lot of people in the scriptures started small. Well, all of them did except for Adam and Eve. But they all started small. They all started as, if you will, little nobodies, so to speak. David, it seemed like that his father didn't even have him in mind. Not that his father was bad to him. Not that his father didn't love him. Nothing like that. But David was the youngest. And so he wouldn't really be seen in line for some great special blessing. But it was he who God chose out there that was kind of forgotten, seemed like, and out there doing the menial task of shepherding the sheep. It was him who God chose. I mean, you and I can see people all throughout the scriptures that God rose up. Uh, they, I mean, God used a woman one time to win a battle for, for Israel uh, back in the early chapters of the book of Judges. You remember when she took, that, took the Syrian general and uh, brought it, she told, her, told him to come into her tent. She gave him some milk. When he lay down, he got sleepy. She took a tent peg and killed him with it. And then when they came looking for him, she showed that to him. She showed, showed him the... The man. My point is simply uh, back then women didn't do things like that. Uh, but you see, friend, God used people. He's always used people and bringing them from small little places. You may be thinking today, oh, I've got this in my heart to do. It seems like such a small thing now. It seems like it's almost impossible. It seems like it's just not doable. Where in the world would I ever get the resources? How in the world would I ever get the backing? How will I ever get the understanding? How how will I ever get in that position to do it? But I'm telling you something. If it's the will of the Holy Spirit, He can take care of all those arrangements for you. Amen. It seemed impossible that they would get this temple built back. As a matter of fact, they had the critics. They had those that would bring in all of these wonderful facts of how impossible it would be. How many has ever heard a little talk like that? All that negative criticism, but not only that. Sometimes people will tell you, you might share this vision in your heart. You might tell somebody, this is something I'd really like to do. This is something that I really feel motivated to do. And they might tell you, well, you could if this would happen. You could if that would happen. This is why that's not such a good idea is because this person will never do it or they'll never let it go or this will never come together. I'm here to tell you all of those things may be facts, but did you know something? There is a God in heaven that ordains, listen, that ordains the movement of our life that will give you and I these abilities if he has placed them in our heart to do. Friend, you'll notice that he, this Bible said the hands of Jerubbabel have laid this house. He had gotten it started. How many times have you ever saw people get things started and didn't finish them? How many times have you ever saw something, you know, talked about? It just never was put in motion. Things that were, you know, had, had, had been prepared for. David, I mentioned him a while ago, he wanted to build a temple himself. That was his real desire. He had a motivation for it. He had a desire for it. He had the means. He had the position. Everything, listen, was at his disposal to get it done, but God said no. Why? Because had David built the house, the house would have been dedicated in David's name because he was a warrior king. But Solomon was not a warrior king. 
Solomon was coming after David. Solomon could build this house and it'd be dedicated to God. People would recognize it as God's blessing. People would recognize it as God's doing, but not in the days of David. But David understood that. He understood that. May I quote Clint Eastwood this morning? He said, a man needs to know his limitations. <laughs> Did you know that is true? We do need to know our limitations. But friend, I'm telling you, listen, what God has put in your heart, he takes those limits off, if you will. He will bring those things about when you confirm that it is he that has done it. When he inspires us, not everybody takes his direction in life, even though they may follow that inspiration, and they may not take the direction God intended. Satan would like to rob you of these things. He did his best to stop this temple from being built. He did his best to stop Jerusalem from ever coming back together and becoming a nation again. He did his best even in modern times in uh, May the 15th, 1948, when Jerusalem was declared a state by Great Britain, when it was declared independent, and they declared their independence. Did you know all the narrow Arab nations around them declared war upon them in that very Every day, their plan was that they would destroy them before they ever got started, that they would wipe them out before they ever got established, that they would do them in before they could ever, before it could ever become a reality. But what happened? Miraculously, a little country that had not very much organization, that had not very much weaponry, that had not very much, uh, no battle experience as a group. I mean, just every odd you could think, everything you could think of was stacked against them. It should have been impossible for them to overcome, but what did they do? They overcame. And what have they been doing? They've been overcoming for over 75 years now. Why? Because it's God that said so. It was God that inspired them. It was God that made them a promise. It was God that prepared their destiny. Have they done everything right? Absolutely not. But it was God that is proving himself. Because, listen, uh, they trusted in him. They had a desire for it. He put that desire in their heart. The Bible tells us that he's placed eternity in our hearts. What does that mean? That means on the inside of every person they know, whether they'll admit it or not, you may run into some people that's brainwashed enough to think that this world is all there is. You may, but honestly, down in their heart of hearts, they know better. They know there's something beyond this. They know there's something grander and greater than this. They know this didn't just all happen by chance. They know that their ancestors was not spineless uh, amoebas in some pool somewhere. They know that it could not have came together and happened like evolutionary thinking says so. They know that. They know it. They may not admit it, but they know it. According to the Bible, they have to become foolish thinkers to disregard it. In Romans chapter number, uh, chapter number one, the Bible said they thinking themselves to be wise became fools. They have to choose to be foolish in their thinking because they know better. He's placed eternity in our hearts. We really, down in our hearts of hearts, we know and we desire and we want to believe that yes, there is a God up there and yes, he loves us. And yes, he has spoken good for us. He's spoken good for me, amen. He's spoken good for us. Zerubbabel was facing insurmountable odds. And he despised, if you will, all of these things <coughs> that was making that any harder. Oh, but can I say today, listen, he was going to be used to bring focus in a chaotic world, to bring reestablishment in a nation that had lost its hope. What is the Holy Spirit doing with the church today? Is it not some of the same things? Is he not using us today in many ways to bring a focus to a chaotic world, to bring hope, listen, to a hopelessness, to bring help to people who need help? Oh, friend, I'm telling you, what wonder, wonderful stories that we can hear. Uh, some of them I can mention personally, but I can't uh, mention the people's names. I don't have their permission. But listen, there's stories uh, that we could share with you of people who are in those gutters. I mean, I'm talking about young people who had almost totally ruined their life through drug abuse, through promiscuity and all these kind of things and almost totally ruined any, or, any sort of opportunity and any sort of chance they would have had 
to have a good life, but yet now they have came to Christ and listen, the Lord is bringing him through uh, these, listen, he's bringing them through all of these uh, these uh, 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 terrible uh, connections that they had. He's bringing them through all of these consequences, if you will, that they have stirred their own self, but he has strengthened them in bringing them, friend, and he's making them rise up and causing them to be something totally and absolutely different, and therefore they're proving themselves to the people and world around them every day through the strength of the Holy Spirit. All people had despised what they were into. They looked at them and took a dim view. They looked at them and they marginalized them. And they put them way down there and said they'll never amount to anything. They'll never accomplish anything. They'll never do anything. No, they, they don't have the right breaks. And they're not, and they ruined their chances. <laughs> oh, but I'm thankful that God don't see things the way we do. I'm thankful for it. He'll look on my heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, when Samuel couldn't understand, why'd you pick him? My goodness, here was Eliab. Look at Eliab. He's almost as tall as Saul. I mean, he looks kingly. He looks manly. He looks macho. He looks like the man. I mean, he's, he's the one. Why didn't you pick him, Lord? Why didn't you pick Shuna? He's almost as good as Eliab. Why didn't you pick him? He kept bringing these sons by and he wouldn't pick them. And, uh, and Samuel couldn't understand it. Well, why don't you pick them? And finally they ran out. And Samuel had to say to Jesse, is this all your kids? Is this all your boys? The Lord hadn't picked them. I would have picked one. I would have picked that first one. He looked good to me. No, he didn't pick none of them. Jesse said there's one left. Basically, he said he's a kid. I got one little old kid son left. And I'm, it's going to take a while now, Samuel. I'm going to have to send to get him. I'm going to have to send over yonder and get him. Matter of fact, we can almost read this in. I don't want you to do that. You study it. I don't want to give you my estimations or opinions. But when we read that scripture, it's almost like it's going to be a little trouble to bring him because somebody's going to have to watch the sheep. I'm going to have to send and fetch him. I mean, in that, we see somebody's going to watch the sheep. Somebody's got to go over and deal with what the job he's doing. In other words, it's going to be a little trouble now. My goodness, all these boys are older. All these boys are wiser. All these boys are stronger. <laughs> all these boys have more experience. All these boys are in line for the inheritance over him. But I'll send and get him. When he came in, the Lord says, this is him. And we can see from Scripture, Samuel was puzzled. <laughs> oh, you know what? I would that happen for you in your life. Amen. That God would just bless you so much that people might have to fold their hands and say, why? Why is he doing that? Why did he choose that? Why did God, why is he blessing them? How are they doing all this? What makes them so special? Samuel looks at David, a little old kid. Handsome, little old ruddy kid. Full of energy. Needing some, you know, needing probably a little more wisdom than he had. He looks at him and he's puzzled and the Holy Spirit told him, he said, you look on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God looks into a life that the world would say would be worthless and said, no, there's potential there. I've had people work in ministry and quite frankly, I wondered how in the world will they ever be able to do anything with it? How will they ever be ever effective in it? How would God use them? How in the world is this going to work? I mean, in my way of thinking, I had three or four people in mind. But that was not the one that the Holy Spirit brought, listen, brought to the position. How is this going to work? I got a good case in point this morning. I don't want to embarrass her. Look at Miss Christie over there. I believe you would say that she's pretty effective at being a blessing in the youth. We've got 12-year-olds taller than her. 
Lord, I seen her come in with them one day. Just watching them all come through and it. Oh, there she is. There, there she is right there. It wasn't that I was against her. It wasn't that I didn't think that she had potential. It wasn't that I didn't think that she could handle things. I just wondered how in the world is that little woman going to do any good at this? You know what I started doing? She's got a heart for it, God. She's willing to step into the position. She even seems like she's enthusiastic about it. Bless her, Lord, bless her. Lay it on, Father. Give her what she needs. Help her. Oh, friend, listen. I'm telling you, hey, I'm thankful. He knows more than I do, amen? I'm thankful he sees what I can't see. I'm thankful, friend, listen, when you and I might look at things and think how hard and how difficult it's going to be. I mean, some of you folks that are stepping up to the plate and restarting this elementary ministry, you may, you may listen, you may be tempted to have this attitude, what's the use? We've lost too much time. Too many kids have went other places. We don't have all that many little kids here. What's the use? I mean, we started meeting one or two times and we didn't hardly have anybody. What's the use? I mean, my goodness, let's just go ahead and let them get established somewhere else. Did you know something? Most people, listen, most of us as people don't like to begin, do we? We don't like the beginning of things too well. As a matter of fact, we don't like that process of growing things too well, attaining knowledge and, uh, you know, and, and wisdom and understanding through living and life experience. We like to have it just all in a hurry. We like to just, you know, just have it real quickly. Have it done. We want it now. Most people like to join things that are already working, already established, already, you know, operating. They don't like to, to you know, do things that need doing, so to speak. They like to, they like to join stuff that's already done. And listen, in the beginning of those processes is where we find ourselves pretty vulnerable at times. That's where we find ourselves dealing with these, with these emotions that, and these attitudes that would say, well, is it really worth it? That's what we need to ask ourselves sometime, isn't it? Why are we doing this? Is it worth it? What do I believe? What's my purpose? I've said it over and over in reflection of the elementary ministry that we're restarting our own kids is worth it. Amen? Amen. Some can say, oh, you don't have any more than 10 or 15 teenagers. Why even have a program? Because those 10 or 15 are worth it. That's why. Friend, it, listen. I'm telling you, people is worth the trouble. Amen? Look what Christ did. Christ did it because he'd rather have us up there with him than he had to have us separated from him. And he did it. He did it himself. You want to do something right? Do what? Do it yourself. <laughs> that don't, that's not always true, is it? <laughs> no. I've done things myself, and it didn't take me long to figure out that wasn't right. <laughs> but, friend, I'm telling you, listen. Hey. Look what Christ did, and he did it all because of people. All because of people. I don't like to hear anybody call trash. I don't like to hear anybody call worthless because the Lord never looked at them that way. Friend, I'm telling you, we're here to accentuate the person's blessings and their potential, not to tear them down. Amen. And I want you to know something, friend. Listen, don't give up those dreams don't give up those inspirations. Don't give up those things. I'm here to tell you, listen, you might say, well, the Lord just can't use me. Nathan is going to show us some scripture that's going to prove that completely wrong as Brother Donald's coming, as Miss Sandra and the fellows are coming back. Don't start playing quite yet again. But 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. Let's look at that real quickly for a moment. Look at that. He said, for you see your calling, brethren. That word brethren means believers. How that not many wise men after the flesh. What does that mean? Is that putting down ed ed education? No. Studies? No. Matter of fact, I applaud people that went through the trouble to get those things. Absolutely. It cost them something. Many of them 40 years old before they get their student loans paid off. No, I'm not putting down education. But he said it's not because of that. He said not many mighty. 
real noble people, people that starts with a silver spoon in their mouth. Look at that. That's what he's talking about. Not many mighty, not many noble are called from great noble families. Look at the next verse. It said, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. What does that mean, foolish? Well, I'm a good picture of that today, but listen, what he's talking about is things that the world would say is foolish. Kind of like Samuel when he looked at David and said, why did you choose him? You know, it's kind of baffling. Like the, all the Arab countries with all their organized armies and all their hardware, their machinery and their mechanism and all that, why couldn't we beat a little old bunch of people that just started? But they couldn't. Why? Great Britain, looking at this country way back in its inception, they were the most powerful country on earth. And they got beaten by their own colonies? Why? How did it happen? How did it happen? That's what he's talking about. Things that the world would have said is foolish. These wise people that would look at something and go ahead and disdain it. It's almost like God rubs their noses in it says, no, I can use that. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Weak things. Weak things. Like I just illustrated. Things that the world say, that'll never work. They don't have what they need. They can't do it. It can't be done. Weak things. Look at the next one. And base things of the world. And things which are despised. If God chose things which are despised. It's been said that money can't buy happiness. Heard two fellows talk about that just recently. One of them said I'd hold up through the drive, cried in my Cadillac, that I had to be depressed on my bicycle. You'll get that after service. But he said, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That word, things that are not, things that... <laughs> Can you say that? That's not even put together. That hadn't even come to be. That doesn't, doesn't even exist. <laughs> doesn't even exist. And you're saying God can use something that don't even exist? I like what Ephesians 3.20 says, don't you? He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly. Above that, that we are able. Look at that. Ask or think according what? To the power that works in us. Notice the next verse back over there in 1 Corinthians, though, if you will. But notice this next verse. He said he does all these things that no flesh should glory in his presence. In other words, he gets all the glory, we get all the blessing. Can I say it again? Let me say it to this side. He gets all the glory, we get all the blessing. Let me say it over here. He gets all the glory, we get all the blessing. <laughs> Pretty good. But notice how he brings all this about. Notice the next verse. But of him are ye in Christ. Look at that. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Who of God, Christ Jesus now, we're in Christ. Christ is in God. Made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You want to know, you want to know how to really listen, how to really enjoy God's blessings, you know what he says. Understand who Christ is and who you are in Christ. And notice the last verse. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Let him glory in the Lord. The Lord's done it all, isn't it? Amen. Yeah, the Lord's made it possible. The Lord has made it happen. You got things you're praying for. Don't you let that devil talk you into giving up on that. You keep praying. You got dreams in your heart. You know they're listening. They're not things, friend, that it's going to take you into the ways of the flesh. And by the way, God does not lead us into sin to accomplish his will. God does not lead us into sin to accomplish his will. He says very plainly in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He don't lead us into sin to accomplish his will. Some people got that dumb idea. Well, I'm going to go out here and I'll get into all this stuff that I know ain't right. I'll finally get established. I'll finally get some money. I'll finally get this person I want. I'll finally get this. I'll finally get that. There's no guarantee in that because I'm here to tell you, friend, the wages of sin is death. Those relationships die off. 
those opportunities subside. Those kind of things, friend, are the things that leaves people disillusioned and disappointed, dissatisfied and unfulfilled. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You got a dream in your heart. You believe God's put it there. Don't give up on it. Listen, you got something in your heart to do and you know the Holy Spirit's put it there. It seems like it's impossible. Oh, friend, listen, you don't, it don't seem like you've got any help, any encouragement. Let me be a voice crying in the wilderness, so to speak, for you today. Hey, don't give up on that. Don't throw in the towel. This morning, if you're here and the Holy Spirit's been dealing with your heart, you've had such a heavy conviction upon your heart because you don't know Christ really personally. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sin. Maybe he's taught you even couldn't. I don't know. I don't know anybody's life here. But regardless, today I want you to know from the authority of Scripture, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly. You'll find rest for your souls. I got down on your level. The Bible said, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Romans 10, 13, shall be saved. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He did not say if you'll come up and tell Austin that, you'll be saved. If you'll come up and get Brother Donald to help you, which wouldn't be a bad idea, but you'll be saved. That's not what he said. He said, if you'll ask me yourself, if you'll just ask me yourself, I won't turn you away. You'll be saved. You'll be saved, and in your heart you will know that you have received right then in that moment eternal life. You will know that you have passed from a certain death unto life. You'll become a different person, friend. Old things will pass away. It'll be, it'll be so, listen, so revealing to you. It'll be so startling. And it says, behold, all things become new. You'll ride home and see things you didn't see before because the Holy Spirit has woke your spirit up and, and give you what God, listen, intended for you to have all the time give you that understanding and that enlightenment that is he himself inside you. He wants to do that for you today. You'll start small just like we all do. But I'll tell you, listen, you'll be connected with the highest and your life will never be the same. If you're here in a backslidden condition or you're watching in a backslidden condition, friend, the Lord desires for you to come back to fellowship with him. Scripture tells us that if we have sinned, that if we'll confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because he is our advocate. We have an advocate, a representation up there in the throne room of God. And he is our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He wants to restore you to fellowship with him today. If you got some sort of little pet sin that's been hindering you and robbing you of your dreams, friend, listen. He wants to bring clarity and confidence back and focus back to your life. He wants to do a lot of stuff this morning. Whether you come up here or you do it back there, listen, if you've got, you've got a heavy heart for any reason, don't leave the same way you came. Let it start right here. Let a change of direction take place right here today, this morning. Friend, you'll never, ever be sorry of it. Zerubbabel, by the way, he completed that temple. And that temple was used until Herod added to it in the days of Christ. He, he completed that. As I said, all of his efforts, it seemed impossible, difficult at best. They all were blessed by God. Listen. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. It's impossible for him to do nothing. 
Share it with him. Leave it with him. Listen. But let him do something great in your life today. As we stand. being such good listeners. I just trust the Lord has used us to help you. That you'll be blessed as you go. That's our one heart's desire. Miss Christy, thank you for letting me use you as an example this morning, which I don't do too much. But uh, remember this evening, we got Bible study tonight, so please come back. I know you'll be blessed by our teachers, if you will. Uh, the Wednesday evening service this week, and also, as we did mention, our youth ministries are elementary ministries, and uh, please pray for those things, invite people to them, uh, unless you and I do what we can to be supportive not only of those ministries, but every ministry of the church. And can I just say today for all of our teachers, our deacons, all of our people that serve the church, thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. All of our worship folks, our musicians, thank you so much. And listen. You may say, well, I just sit here. I'm just on the pew. Without you, myself, or none of the people I mentioned would even be needed. Amen? Without you, Drew, here. Thank you for being here. Appreciate everybody joining us today. As always, we appreciate Brother Nathan, his work back there in the booth, making all these screens possible and everything, our live stream possible. Appreciate that. Today, uh, remember Miss Gail next Wednesday. Mostly because I put her a roller.